Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I see that the Prime Minister has given a very broad um, spectrum of this barrel concession. And maybe deep down inside, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister himself would recognize um, how the state of the economy is impacting the people of St. Lucia, Mr. Speaker. He went to great lengths, Mr. Speaker, to explain to all of us that he is not going to include the 2.5% uh, levy on the barrels. But that is his standard policy. Anything that does not have that, the 2.5% does not apply. So there's nothing new here, Mr. Speaker. He hasn't done, done any special favor for anybody. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I would have expected the special favor that the Prime Minister, member from Castries East, would have spoken about is that given how people are suffering in this country right now, that he would have extended the barrel concession all the way until June of next year. And certainly, members of the opposite side here would support any amendment to this particular motion that would allow the barrel concession to go to June. Because the fact is, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister, when he was introducing the 2.5% levy, you were here, Mr. Speaker, repeatedly said that it was not on food. And that the intention was that the 2.5% levy would not have an impact on food. He repeated it every single time, Mr. Speaker. Every time. In fact, when he left the House, every single press conference he did, he said, I want to remind everybody, in case you, you mislead me, you misinterpret what I'm saying, the 2.5% levy is not on food and will not impact the price of food. Tonight. Well, Mr. Speaker, Tonight. we see that the price of food has gone up because the policy of the 2.5% at this particular time, Mr. Speaker, is flawed. Because there's no way to have introduced this on goods and services, Mr. Speaker, and it would not have had an impact on food. It's raised the cost of doing business for every uh, uh, office, in this, uh, for every business in this country. And is now having a significant, dramatic effect <coughs> on the cash flow. People don't have money, Mr. Speaker. They're paying too much in taxes. And so therefore, I'm asking, Mr. Speaker, if in fact now the Prime Minister, only after two months of introducing it from services, but has had the benefit of seeing it on, on goods for a longer period of time, and recognizing that the price of food has gone up, would he give some relief to the people of St. Lucia, at minimum, to extend the barrel concession all the way till June? And if not, suspend the tax and try again because it's not achieving what he wants in creating incremental revenue for the government and not impacting the poorest of the poor in this country. The poorest of the poor that he has so adequately identified. Don't come here and tell me or tell us or try to convince us that you are caring government in a time when you have imported inflation taking place. And you, and you contribute and you mu allow that to multiply by allowing the price of gas to go up. The price of gas is on, in the country, in, in, internationally, it's $75 a barrel. We're still selling gas at $16 a gallon and plus. We're still selling cooking gas for almost $40 for a 22 cylinder. That is a wickedness in this country. Where is the care? Where is the care and the compassion for the people that you say, the poor support that you keep identifying? Where is that compassion? You want to come to this house, Mr. Speaker, and speak about politics and about me, and I'm the target? I want to reiterate. When we lost the election, I took responsibility for my party. I congratulated the government. Something that was never afforded me when I became prime minister. But that's fine. That's OK. And I sat my, on my side here, and at no time I've had any animosity or any regret, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, you see where we're going? The priority in today's House, at a time when unemployment is increasing, when we have deals that are being made, secret deals that are being made, in which we're not being told what's being done, where the patrimony of this country is being destroyed, Mr. Speaker, and this government wants to come now and talk about when there are allegations, they're going to stand up for those allegations? Really? That's, where, that's, where, that, that's what the government wants to convince people? I don't even have to get into the comments by the government, by the Prime Minister of Grenada. It's not for me. The public has interpreted it. They all come here and, and want to say that we're influencing that opinion. It speaks for itself. 
what he said. It speaks for itself as what he intended it to mean. And it speaks to itself in terms of what the MP from Castries Central said. So is he denying that the, Cast the member from Castries Central said? That he wants to amend the Constitution, given his own way, to allow persons who are not born in St. Lucia? Go and try it. Go and try it. Go and see what the people of St. Lucia have to say about you. And even the CCJ is a great example. You all have so much faith in the people of St. Lucia that you all will go to the CCJ and not have an, uh, uh, a referendum? That's the confidence that you have in the people of St. Lucia? You said the people of St. Lucia are on your side and they understand the issues. How many St. Lucians really understood what you've done and what we've, what we've exchanged it for? So Mr. Speaker, I want to come back to the tax. The fact is that this economy is reeling under the mismanagement of this government. The Carrie Chris report, I'm so happy you read it, because the Carrie Chris report confirms all the lies that y'all said when y'all were in opposition, that the country was being mismanaged and there was no money. The fact is when you came in, the economy that same year grew 12.5%. And on the growth of the decisions that we made when we were in the government, it grew another 18.5%. And that's why I was looking over at the Minister of, of Tourism and the member from Castry South, whether in fact he, is, has, he has informed his Prime Minister and his Minister of Finance as to what the state of tourism is today. So the Carrie Chris report says the assumption is, Mr. Speaker, that the economy is going to continue growing and that the fundamental biggest contributor is tourism. And it's expectation that tourism is going to get back to 92% of where it was in 2019. How? Since June, Mr. Speaker, this, the tourism numbers have declined significantly. In fact, the greatest contributor, which is the US market, was down 36% in August. And the expectation is, is that the number of arrivals are going to continue to decline all the way until November. Maybe in November we might see some reprieve. And the reality is, the lessons that he should have learned this summer, he has not. And therefore, the same inadequacies we have with airlift this summer, we're going to have it again next summer. But guess what? FCC gave a report, Mr. Speaker, that said the cruise industry is back in the Caribbean stronger than it was before 2019. We've not seen that. You haven't even come close to the 2019 numbers, Mr. Speaker. Not even close. This isn't Not even close. We're talking about 20. We're talking about 2023. We're talking about 2023 because the Carrie Chris report was the evaluation of the economy in 2022. We're now in 2023, and that's why, Mr. Speaker, I am again concerned, and all solutions should be concerned, that a prime minister would stand here, Mr. Speaker, refer to a report of last year to give us comfort for this year? Really? A government that doesn't even understand, doesn't even understand, does not even understand, Mr. Speaker, does not even begin to understand the impact of taxation on this economy. And when you talk about that you want to do things for the poorest of the poor, they're suffering, they don't have jobs, it's now costing them more money for bus fares, more money for bread, more money to get cooking gas than ever it has ever costed in this country. And the reality is by you allowing your government to allow those things to go up, even when commodity prices come down, those prices will not come down. And you want to talk about that you're, 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 you're helping? How? And if you continue to want to believe that 15-2 Yes, it's a major victory in Parliament. But in, par in popular vote, Mr. Speaker, okay, you should be keeping your eyes open, and particularly with the movement on the ground. And the reality is there will be a march on November 30th, Mr. Speaker. A march to protest the GPH deal. A march to protest the 2.5% tax. A march to protest the cost of bus fares in this country. 
a march to protest the condition of the roads in this country because we have a, we have a lazy ruler, not a heavy ruler. That's what we have, Mr. Speaker. We're going to be having a march to protest against what is taking place with crime in this country. We're going to be taking have a march to talk about the corruption in this country and the continued implementation of fear in the community of this country. You have a minister of government that goes on a radio show, Mr. Speaker, and says he's getting information from the police and the prime minister has not fired him yet? So how do we take those words that he said? Oh, if anybody points out any form of corruption in my government, I'm going to deal with it immediately. Well, Mr. Prime Minister, that is not legal. It's against the civil rights of people. How can you have a minister of government admitting publicly, publicly admitting that he's getting information from policemen to come after individuals? How? How can that happen, Mr. Speaker? How can that happen? And he says nothing. We have a GPH deal in which we are selling off the revenue of our ports for 40 years. You cannot explain what we're getting. And then you're turning around now and you're destroying SLASPA. You're the same, you're the same government that wanted to privatize the airport. So you have an entity that is as successful as SLASPA. National pride. And a, a party that says that they are for the people? You and you're going to take away all the jobs? Really well, Mr. Speaker, I have to look at what the facts are. Are people leaving SLASPA? Are there senior executives leaving SLASPA? Are there persons who were in SLASPA and were negotiating the deal and today they are with the same company they were negotiating with? Is it true that the chairman of Invest and Lucia, that his brother is the one who got the job? And, and, our, and the justification by the minister is what? He's qualified? And so, and so, sorry? Who was the dean for the government vehicles? Tell us now, tell us Mr. Speaker, if we're going to talk about government vehicles, I certainly would like to know. Yeah. I saw that there was a, a cabinet a, approval for the purchase of, of a vehicle by CIP. I would like to know where that, where that, where that vehicle is. We're going to talk about government vehicles. Okay, that's what we're talking about. So I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, the optics, the optics, I have no brother-in-law, let me put on record, I have no brother-in-law who owns any, any car company. None. Okay? But well, Mr. I'm Speaker, saying, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the things that they want to ascribe to Mr. Yes, Mr. Member for Castries South. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order, I think it is really <coughs> unacceptable that a member can tarnish the name of someone who is not in this house. It is one thing to say anything about any member sitting here where we have an opportunity to stand up and defend ourselves. But to tarnish and send Lucian, who is a professional, who was given a job, and tarnish a brother who is a senior banking executive in this country, and suggest that there is something untold that happened between them in the safety of this honorable chamber, knowing that you cannot be sued for the things that you say inside there. And I think, Mr. Speaker, you should ask the honorable member to show some decency some dignity and some decorum and respect for this house. You could say it about any one of us. We can stand, we can answer you. But do not attack St. Lucians who are not present and cannot defend themselves because you have the safety of this house. It is what cowards do. Be a man and take on the men and women around this table where we can answer you. It is unacceptable, honorable member. And Mr. Speaker, he denied Janine Compton of God, but we'll, he'll get his answers in a while. But Mr. Speaker, I think you ought to tell him that this is really unacceptable in this honorable chamber. Member for Castries South, I, I don't think the member from Miku South has crossed the line in pointing out the fact that there is a familiar relationship between two people and asking familiar and asking a question. I don't think he has crossed the line yet. Please proceed, Member. Mr. Speaker, I want to give the, um, the member from uh, Castries South comfort that what I've just said, I also said in public. So, and I think I was even more specific in public than I was in, in the House. But Mr. Speaker, if in fact I am to genuinely believe that the member from Castries South is concerned, when the same member from Castries Central attacked the same managing director of the bank, and said that the, the person was in a car accident 
and that he was drunk and that he did not call the police. Where were the voices? <laughs> remember, remember from Mikusov, you do have a motion before you to debate. I'm but, trying uh, to make the, the, the nexus between what you just said there and the motion. I was, Please, just re I was responding to the member of, 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 of uh, Castro. The only thing you ought to respond to is the motion before you. Very well, Mr. Speaker, but I'm just saying we cannot have a double standard in our house. If we're going to want to make statements and say that they're coming from a place of integrity and morality, then let's be consistent with it. The fact is, is that a, a port was sold. The revenue stream for the port was assigned to a foreign company for 30 years with an extension for 40 years. And that means they sold? Of course, because the revenue is gone. And you know, and the member, and the member, the members there are talking about, and again, I want to reiterate to the member of, of, of View 4 itself. When he came to this house and spoke about a, an account in Panama, you want to speak about it? Just hold on. Member of Gaspi, sir? Okay, he is, he is withdrawn. Please proceed, he is withdrawn. Mr. Speaker, again, here we go, you know. You have, you have, you have a deal in which the revenue stream from the port, all of it, has been assigned to a foreign company. That means that you keep the land, but the land is of no use to you because the, all the revenue potential for the land has been given to a foreign company. A foreign company that does not even have the balance sheet that they can come and borrow the money here in St. Lucia. They have to come to a local bank. So the question begs, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you have allowed Slasper to have borrowed the money if that's what you wanted to do? And keep control of your own revenue stream and pay them a management contract if they're so good. And give them a management contract where you can pay them for their costs and give them an incentive if they're able to improve. But no, the geniuses, you all wanted to go the same thing you all wanted to do for the airport and privatize the airport. You're, you're with so, in such a way to do that. You've come now and done it to our seaports. And in doing it, you are destroying Slaspa, a statutory agency that has been successful for over 40 years, employing and developing solutions. The same solutions that are now leaving Slaspa to go and work for the foreign entity. And now they can afford to pay them because you've given them a sweetheart deal, a deal that you've not even been able to explain to the public of St. Lucia. The question is, why? And I really, I'm looking forward to seeing what the Bank of St. Lucia is going to use as collateral for the loan. Because I know that when we were doing the loan deal for HIA, we had to come to this house and do a bank guarantee. So if you've not sold the land, what, what, what equity are you going to give the bank? What is it in this deal, right? So, Mr. Speaker, I'm so happy that the member from Castries East has spoken about the Carrie Chris report. Carrie Chris report is a very good evaluation as what has transpired. I'm proud that even during the COVID period that we did not see a decline or reduction in our credit rating. And I want to say that the credit rating has not changed. B, B, B minus. And it's not until this government is able to perform over the next two years, and I hope that they do, but certainly all the signs are, Mr. Speaker, we're not performing. Because if we're going to be depending on tourism to grow, it's not growing. If we're depending on agriculture, if we're depending on construction, where is it? This government is going in reverse gear. I know, Mr. Speaker, I look over at St. Vincent. St. Vincent has managed to build a brand new airport. Not just a terminal, you know, Mr. Speaker a whole runway, took down two hills and built an airport. They took, they, took, they took the English money, the British money, Mr. Speaker, the same money that we're using for the Millennium Highway and the West Coast, that we can't seem to get off the ground. We have a bridge that's built, but we can't seem to get the roundabout done. If I, if I, was, the member, if I was the Minister of Infrastructure, I actually would be embarrassed to show my face in public, Mr. Speaker. Okay? So the fact is, is that, you know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the buck stops with the minister. If there's a problem, get rid of it and solve it because you are working for the people of St. Lucia. Don't come and give people excuses. I would be embarrassed to come in public if I was the minister of infrastructure. So all I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, all of these things are taking place and this government is not performing and they want to know why people are upset not because of lies, it's because people are feeling it. People are feeling it in their pockets. I see the, the minister from, the member from, from View Fort South. He said, I must pro provide proof, Mr. Speaker, that View Fort is not included in the deal. He's in government. He's in government. 
How come nobody from this government can say categorically that they're going to develop the South? It's in your manifesto. Who could not see the, the sense in building a port in View Fort to help the people in the South? Who could not see the sense in, in doing a home port to be able to get the airport tax? All these things need to be explained, Mr. Speaker. And the Carrie Chris report shows the economy was well managed during COVID. That we gave you a foundation. You all said that there would be no money. You all have had more money than in any time in the history of St. Lucia. By 2022, we had generated more tax revenue than we had in 2020, uh, in 2019. More. Based on the fundamentals we put in place. At a time when we were saying open the doors, Labour said close the doors. And the moment they got in, state of emergency is gone, to hell with protecting the people of St. Lucia and their rights, and open up as quickly as possible. How many more people died? How many more people died? Over 800 people died during COVID. I'm proud of the fact that when we left office, it was 88. And that was 88, too many. Too many. Too many. 88, too many. Who said that? Go ahead. Horses before hospitals. Let me hear it. The same member who wanted to talk about horses. I said, we had, I'm proud of the fact we only had 88. And 88 was too many, in case you don't remember. 88 is too many. Now, if 88 is too many, how much is 500? How much is 500? Because in an hour, your policies, your policies, your policies. When we had COVID, we had nothing. We didn't even have ventilators. We, didn't have, we had nothing. We had nothing. We had no ventilators. We had nothing. We didn't even know what we were dealing with. By the time you had Delta, you knew what the policies that would work, but you all ignored it. You, had, you ignored it. And you deliberately allowed people to be exposed in this country. Why? Why? And then now the economy is growing. You want to take credit? What did you all do? All the projects that the, the Minister from Finance has spoken about, every single one of them was started and done by United Workers' Party. Every single one. But they were in process and you inherited it. The ones that, the ones that you could stop, you stopped. Like what? Rodney Bay Road, HIA Airport, St. Jude's. Okay, roads in the south. Want me to keep going? All the things that you stopped. Keep going. Mr. Speaker. Keep going. This is a government that wants to continue to believe in its own imagination, that it cares about the people. It doesn't care about the people. There's nothing in the policies of this government that show me you care. If you really cared and you want to turn and you said today you want to start afresh, allow the concessions on the barrels to go to June. Allow it to go to June. Or better yet, agree that your policies were misguided and, and the two and a half percent tax which was not supposed to impact the, the cost of food and has, that you're gonna rethink it. And you're gonna figure out a better way. And again, you know, Mr. Speaker, you come to the house, you want to fool the people. Two years, $66 million, that's what you're looking to, you're gonna put everybody through this kind of pain for $66 million? And you're boasting as to how well CIP is doing? Up to now, you all can't give a report how you spend the money in the economic fund. How? It's not even in the consolidated account. All the claims you made that we weren't providing the reports, all the reports are there. You said that um, Tara King received money. You've been in government for two and a half years. Show the people where, where. You have somewhere to go, minister? Okay. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm grateful that the prime minister broadened the scope of discussion so we can speak not just about the barrels, but about holistically his policies and strategies as it pertains specifically to helping the most, the poorest of poor in this country. And I wanna talk about, and I've, I've spoken about that your policies are not working. The things that, that impact the poorest of the poor, the price of bread, price of electricity, price of bus fares, and now the price of, of basic food commodities, everything has gone up regardless of whether it is price protected or it has um, that on it or not. Because the cost of operations of the grocery stores has gone up and the profit margin has gone up. And therefore it's being passed on to those goods indirectly, not because of your tax directly, but indirectly because of the tax. 
And so that I'm saying to the Prime Minister, if he has a heart, if we are to genuinely believe him that he cares about the poorest of the poor, you have somewhere to go? The church service is not until Saturday, huh? Okay? So, oh, and what you're doing is not petty. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that's full of bluff. This is a government that continues to want to believe its own propaganda. The reality on the street, if he cares to listen, Mr. Speaker, is people are suffering in this country. And if you genuinely cared, you would extend the barrel concession, but even better yet, Mr. Speaker, you would take away the 2.5% tax because it's not working. It's having a detrimental effect on households in this country, Mr. Speaker. People are suffering. Even the sanitary napkins. I agree with it, but what we are laughing at is why for two years? So what, women are only going to suffer for two years? Make it permanent. Make it permanent. Stop coming here with piecemeal solutions to a problem, Mr. Speaker. That is where people are, are, are taking a pappy show of the government. And sadly, there are too many things that the government promised. The, the, member, the, the Prime Minister, when he was in opposition, promised, Mr. Speaker, if you remember, that instead of the $500 we gave for three months, he said that he would triple it. He would give them $1,500. You're now giving $1,500. So I'm just saying, that's the first month. Come for the next two months, $3,000. $4,500 is what you promised the people, not $1,500. You said we gave $500, you would give $15. So we gave $15, you have to give $45. And you're in a better financial position today to give that to the people. And if you care about the people who are the poorest of the poor, that's what you're going to do. Mr. Speaker, it's your policies that are in a mess and it's impacting, the policies that you have are impacting the, the living standards of people in this country. And you are depressing people. People are, people, Mr. Speaker, I've told you, drop the 2.5% tax. Allow the barrel to be extended to six months. Okay? Give reprieve to the poorest of the poor. And the things that you're supposed to be doing, go and do them. Instead of selling out the assets of the state, and creating a PPP to a foreign company to give them access and control of our ports, build up um, a SLASPA, allow SLASPA to have um, invested, because they, they, they're the ones who built the one that Point Seraphine that did the extension. What's the big deal about extending the North Wharf? That's not, that's not outside of the purview of SLASPA. And the revenue we would have here, and as I said to you, if GPH is so great, let them manage it and give them an incentive. If they get more cruise ships, let them get a bigger bite of it. But do not come and fool the people of this country and give a concession out of all the revenue for the next 40 years of SLASPA that you're gonna cost hundreds of millions of dollars to this state. And you're, crying, you're, and you're crying that you're poor. So that's over 400 million US dollars in revenue you've given up over the 40 years. Okay? 400 million US. Yes. So Mr. Speaker, this government has shown that they've lost their way. They're out of touch with what is going on in the ground. And on November 30th, Mr. Speaker, they will find out what the people really have to say. That people are not happy with how you're governing the country. They're not happy with the fear and intimidation that you're using in government. They're not happy with the double standards that are taking place in this country. And for sure, this is not a government that is putting anybody first. This is a government that continues to protect the victory. Thank you.